Chapter 6, Bone Tissue. In today's lecture, we'll talk about osteoclasts, a cell type whose job it is to destroy bone tissue. They are under the control of parathyroid hormone. So we need to ask, why do I have a hormone and a cell type whose job it is to destroy bone tissue? When would that ever be useful? Because too much of that leads to osteoporosis, one of the diseases that we need to learn about today. Next up, we'll talk about tubercles and spines and the epicondyles. It always amazed me that the muscles and their tendons knew exactly where to connect on the bones. They never missed those bumps and attached off to the side. We'll talk about the rib cage today. Anatomists love to assign jobs to different parts of the body. And if we assign a job to the rib cage, we should say that it moves the lungs. It doesn't do such a very good job of protecting the lungs and heart. We'll talk about the shapes of bones and why they have their particular shapes. And lastly, we'll talk about x-rays and how you can spot signs of child abuse even years after it has occurred. To do that, we'll talk about cartilage first, move on to bone tissue, talking about the cells and the extracellular matrix, we'll talk about how bones grow, we'll talk about a few diseases that illustrate some of the physiology from the previous sections, We'll talk about remodeling bone tissue and how bones can stay healthy. There's going to be a big list of hormones. And lastly, we'll talk about osteoporosis and fractures. So the skeletal system includes our bones, plus cartilages, a number of ligaments, and a few other connective tissues. The skeleton started off entirely cartilage. If we were a shark, that would have been good enough. So one of our questions is, why bone tissue? What makes it so special? In humans, much of the cartilage skeleton gets replaced with bone tissue. Here we can see that in a human fetus, the bone tissue is stained red here, and we can see some gaps where the cartilage still remains. Over here in this uh, series of chicken images, we see that the chicken skeleton starts off as mostly cartilage and over time slowly gets replaced with bone tissue. Yet we still have some significant gaps here between the bones. So much of our bone tissue started off as cartilage and gets replaced while we're a fetus. But not all of the cartilage gets replaced. There's some very important places in the skeleton where cartilage remains especially in our joints and a few other places. There's costal cartilages between our ribs and some other weird cartilages up in our head. Hyaline cartilage is the most abundant of the types of cartilage. It's our basic cartilage type. We've got chondrocytes, which live in lacunae. They secrete extracellular matrix which is mostly glycosaminoglycans, those long proteoglycans that attract water, forming a very dense gel. This gel is very good at absorbing shock, and it's also slippery. There are two other types of cartilage. Elastic cartilage has more elastic fibers in it, and fibrocartilage has more collagen, making it stronger. We tend to have fibrocartilage in places that are under a lot of stress, such as the knees, our vertebral column, and the temporomandibular joint in our jaw. Cartilage can grow one of two ways. Appositional growth means adding an extra layer to the surface of the tissue, whereas interstitial growth means growing from the inside and pushing things outwards. One of the main functions of the skeletal system was in support and movement. As muscles contract, they pull on bones, and that allows us to move around. Another thing that we'll be learning about today is that bones are a very important calcium reserve. It's tricky to store calcium. We'll see that it's a little bit of a dangerous electrolyte, so having a safe place to keep it stored is important. Bone tissue can also store fat, fat, 
and it's the site of our bone marrow where all of the blood is produced. The skeletal system can be involved in protecting parts of the body. For instance, the skull does a pretty good job of protecting the brain. However, the ribs are often mentioned as protecting the heart and lungs, and they don't do a very good job. Pound for pound, muscle is actually much stronger. If you know anybody that does any sort of fighting sport, like martial arts, they can tell you that getting punched in the stomach is a lot better than getting punched in the ribs. In fact, getting punched in the ribs is more likely to break a rib and puncture the lungs, doing more damage to the lungs than would have happened if you had just applied some force to them. So, when it comes to protection, bones can protect some things like the skull, but the rib cage, actually, its major function is in helping the lungs to move. Lastly, the bones can be involved in acid-base balance, but that's not something that we can go into until after we learn about acid-base balance in BI-233. In my arms and legs, I have a number of long bones. These bones have similar shapes that we give names. The diaphysis is the shaft, or the long central portion, whereas the weird bumps on the ends are called the epiphyses. And if I wanted to talk about where those two meet, I could talk about the metaphysis. In my skull and a few other places, I have a number of flat bones. These are sandwiches of compact bone with spongy bone in the middle. If spongy bone is too difficult for you to remember, you can also call it diploe. So those are some of the basics of cartilage and bones. Next up, let's talk more about bone tissue. Bone tissue is made by cells, but there's only a small number of cells in bone tissue. Remember that bone is a type of connective tissue, and this is fairly common for connective tissues to be mostly extracellular matrix. But let's talk about the cells. There are four main cell types, a mesenchymal stem cell, an osteoblast, and an osteocyte are the first three. These all come from one another. The fourth type is an osteoclast, which is an entirely different cell type. Mesenchymal stem cells were those very important cell type that could differentiate into any number of different connective tissue cells. For instance, we already talked about them becoming new fibroblasts when I needed to grow more skin tissue. Here, a mesenchymal stem cell will undergo cell division, producing two cells. One of those stays a stem cell. The other one, if given the right growth factor, can differentiate into what's called an osteochondroprogenitor cell. I think this is the cell type that your textbook talks about. I would prefer you to learn the mesenchymal stem cell. What's important is that, given the right growth factor, it decides to become bone tissue. This progenitor cell very quickly should turn into an osteoblast. That osteoblast can start secreting extracellular matrix, and eventually it becomes a mature osteocyte. Because the mesenchymal stem cells are plentiful, and I never run out of them, I should be able to make any number of osteoblasts and osteocytes as I need. So these osteoblasts are the ones that secrete the extracellular matrix, just like the fibroblasts made the extracellular matrix in our generic connective tissues. This extracellular matrix starts off immature and it later calcifies to turn into bone tissue. To find the immature extracellular matrix, you'd have to go look inside of a fetus, and that's not something that we're going to do. So we'll focus on what this looks like in adult tissue. Once the osteoblast is completely surrounded by this dense extracellular matrix, it differentiates into an osteocyte, a cell that's capable of maintaining that tissue rather than secreting new tissue. So the osteocytes live in little pockets 
called lacunae or lakes and they're connected to one another by tiny little canals called the canaliculi. Osteocytes do not divide, so if I need more bone tissue, I'm going to need some mesenchymal stem cells to migrate into the area. The main function of the osteocytes is to maintain this extracellular matrix. They are capable of repairing small amounts of damage. The last cell type it's not really a bone cell at all, but more of a white blood cell that can come in and digest bone tissue. These are the osteoclasts. They're very large cells with more than one nucleus. They secrete enzymes that can digest the extracellular matrix, releasing calcium. Next up, let's focus on the extracellular matrix. Roughly two thirds of this is calcium phosphate crystals, meaning this is the inorganic portion. The calcium phosphate crystals can react with water to form an even more complicated crystal. Other elements might be incorporated in here, such as fluoride, but the two most important parts are calcium and phosphate. The other third of bone tissue is made up of collagen fibers. This is the organic portion. The collagen fibers are very important. They behave like rebar does in concrete, adding a little bit of flexibility to the tissue rather than simply shearing under stress when it becomes high enough. Without the proper form of collagen, bones become brittle and are highly prone to fractures. A disease called osteogenica imperfecta is an example of this, where people cannot produce the correct type of collagen in bone tissue. We can also see changes to the sclera, or the whites of the eyes, due to the fact that this collagen is not quite the proper type. Compact bone tissue is organized in repeating units called osteons. These osteons contain concentric layers, or lamellae. These all circle around a central canal where blood vessels and nerves are located. Perforating canals would connect from one central canal to another one. So if concentric lamellae circle around a central canal like concentric circles, the circumferential lamellae are around the circumference of compact bone tissue here at the edges, and they bind all of the osteons together. Each osteon is a repeating unit composed of multiple layers of bone tissue. There are collagen fibers within these layers. Within every layer, the collagen fibers run parallel, but in the next layer, they run in the opposite direction, and then again, and again, and again, similar to the way that grains in plywood alternate back and forth. This makes the osteon much stronger. It does not have a weak spot where things could easily be sliced in half. So if the haversion canal is running up the center of the osteon, the perforating canals are here running side to side. In between each of the layers live a number of osteocytes. These are the cells that made the layer as osteoblasts, but once they got surrounded by bone tissue, they differentiated into osteocytes. Tiny little canals remain within the bone tissue, connecting one cell to the next. These canals are called canaliculi. This is important because all of the blood, which contains the nutrients, are at the center, but the nutrients from that blood needs to diffuse through the bone tissue, and that would be very difficult considering how compact bone tissue is. Compact bone is found on the outsides of all of our bones. Spongy bone can be found on the insides. Spongy bone is made up of trabeculae, or these little spicules of bone tissue. 
This bone tissue is about two to five layers thick, but these layers are not concentric. Spongy bone looks irregular at first glance, but these trabeculae actually do align more or less along stress lines. We will see why this happens in a moment. These trabeculae are only a few cell layers thick. Osteocytes live in between the layers in lacunae, just like they do in compact bone, but there is no haversian canal in the center. For that reason, these trabeculae can only be a few layers thick. They must get all of their nutrients from their outer surface rather than their inner surface. Spongy bone undergoes a significant amount of remodeling. This is going to be a theme throughout the rest of the lecture. So if spongy bone is found on the insides of bones and there's a lot of gaps between the trabeculae, those gaps are not empty spaces, but they are filled either with adipose tissue, we would call it yellow marrow, or stem cells that produce all of our blood in which case we would call it red bone marrow. So those are some of the basics of bone tissue, including the basics of compact versus spongy bone, and the four basic cell types that we need to worry about. Not listed in my list here are those mesenchymal stem cells that are ever so important. Next up, we need to talk a little bit about bone physiology. Many of our long bones are hollow at the center. There's compact bone on the outside, spongy bone more towards the insides, but at the very center there is a medullary cavity filled with yellow or red bone marrow. Because they are hollow, this allows the bones to be lighter, making it easier for us to walk around without having to expend so much energy. And it turns out this does not decrease bone strength at all, because of the particular shape of bones. If you look at the femur, you might notice that the head of the femur does not point straight upwards the way that a Fred Flintstone bone might look. Instead, this epiphysis is off to the side. For that reason, when we put weight on the femur, it does not simply get squished downwards, but it tends to bend to one side. One side of the bone tends to get stretched when this happens, and the other side of the bone tends to get compacted. The cells are moved closer to one another. So, in our long bones, this is the pattern that happens. We've got the heads of the long bones pointing off to the side, and for that reason, stress is not applied evenly. We get a lot of stress on the outer surface and the inner surface, but in the center, the two forces counteract one another. There is no net force at the center of the bones, hence they can afford to be hollow without reducing their strength at all. Now, that still leaves the question as to how bones know they can do this, and we will get to that question, but for right now, we need to understand that the long bones are hollow, which reduces their weight, without reducing any of the strength. This also tells us a little bit about the formation of bone tissue. I've got compact bone at the outer edges where the most force is applied. More towards the middle, I can have spongy bone, which isn't quite as strong, and even in some places, I don't need any bone tissue at all. Compact bone tissue is covered in a layer of connective tissue called the periosteum. This includes a lot of dense regular connective tissue, collagen fibers running back and forth. It also includes a bunch of bone cells, namely osteoblasts and osteoclasts. The periosteum surrounds the entire bone, but it does more than just that. It actually penetrates the bone tissue. Some of those collagen fibers go into the compact bone tissue and we call those Sharpie's fibers. For this reason, where a tendon attaches to a bone is not a simple connection. It's actually a very complicated and broad connection. So let's zoom in here. 
the dense regular connective tissue of the tendon becomes the periosteum, and the periosteum has Sharpie's fibers which extend into the bone tissue. So the force that that muscle generates is not applied just in one area, but really over a very broad surface. This makes for a very strong connection. If you've ever tried to remove all of the meat off of a bone, you have found that this is very difficult because there's really no end to the meat and beginning to the bone. All of this material blends into one another. Shin splints are possibly damaged to these Sharpies fibers. I've heard a number of different theories about shin splints, and the best one that I've heard to date is that when muscles pull on bone tissue too strongly, that can pull some of these Sharpies fibers out of their position, causing a bit of inflammation. And a particular type of pain that we call shin splints. I've heard a number of different theories for what actually causes shin splints. This is by far the best, although we still probably don't know exactly what they are. Nevertheless, these are very difficult to heal because it's very difficult for us to take pressure off of our shins to allow this tissue the time to heal that it needs. Here's some histology just for fun. What I would like you to notice is that there's really no line that we can draw, no absolute line between the difference of a tendon versus some fibrocartilage that ultimately becomes the fibers of the periosteum versus bone tissue. All of these tissues blend from one to the next to the next. That is what makes these connections so strong and so secure. So the periosteum includes both those collagen fibers as well as the cellular layer, which has a large number of osteoblasts and some osteoclasts that are going to be involved in the remodeling of bone tissue. On the inside of bones is endosteum. There is no collagen here. We do not need any sort of strong connection for muscles on the insides of bone tissue. So in the endosteum, we find only bone cells, including a whole bunch of osteoblasts, but relatively more osteoclasts. It's that relative difference that I've got more osteoclasts on the inside than I do on the outside. That means that as bones grow, thanks to the osteoblasts, they also tend to get hollowed out from the inside, thanks to the larger number of osteoclasts in the endosteum. So that's the basic physiology of hollow bones, as well as the periosteum and endosteum. Next up, we need to talk about how bones develop. Bones will continue to grow until we're in our 20s or so. But how bones form is a very interesting topic. Let's start with a little bit of terminology. Osteogenesis is the word that we use for the formation of bone tissue whereas ossification is replacing one tissue with bone tissue. We might replace it with immature bone. Calcification is the deposition of calcium phosphate crystals to create mature bone tissue, the stuff that we think of as bones in the human body. There are two main ways that bones can develop. Let's start with endochondral ossification. This is how most of the bones from the neck down develop. They start off as cartilage and slowly get replaced with bone tissue. The picture over here shows bone tissue forming in these transgenic mice. The bones have been tricked into glowing green underneath a UV light. You might notice that the vertebrae right now are pairs of vertebrae. We're starting ossification at a couple of spots, and for many bones, they will grow together to form a single bone rather than a pair. So, endochondral ossification. 
is the mechanism by which bone tissue replaces cartilage tissue. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's a pretty important process, not only for the formation of bone tissue, but as we'll see for the repair of bone tissue later. I start off with a cartilage model. This cartilage is a little bit special. It begins to change and allow blood vessels to grow into it. These blood vessels bring in osteoblasts, which can start forming a bony collar around the outside. But as the blood vessels grow to the inside, these osteoblasts start replacing the cartilage tissue with bone tissue. We would call this the primary ossification center, or the first place that bone tissue is deposited. This initial tissue is spongy bone. The osteoblasts will keep making more and more spongy bone, replacing the cartilage. Eventually, blood vessels will also grow into the epiphyses, creating what are called the secondary ossification centers. Osteoblasts will begin replacing bone tissue here at the ends. As the bone tissue grows, our bones are looking more and more like a mature organ. However, I do not replace all of the cartilage. A couple of places, the cartilage remains, and this is functionally very important. I leave some cartilage here at the ends. We're going to call this articular cartilage, and it's very important for joints. And I also leave some space between the primary and secondary ossification centers. We're going to call these the epiphyseal plates, or the growth plates. Eventually, bone tissue is remodeled so that compact bone is on the outside and spongy bone is on the inside. Now these blood vessels remain after the bone tissue is done growing. The one in the diaphysis we call the nutrient artery and vein, and the ones on the ends we call the metaphyseal vessels. Now in the next chapter, you're going to be learning about a lot of foramen or holes in bone tissue. The nutrient foramen is where the nutrient artery and vein travel from the outside of the body to the inside of the bone marrow. I always wondered how it was that squishy blood vessels could tunnel their way through dense bone tissue, but it turns out I had it backwards. The blood vessels form first, and then the bone tissue grows around them. That is how these holes, called foramen, develop in our skeletal system. There are also periosteal vessels in the periosteum that bring nutrients to the outsides of this bone. The epiphyseal plate will continue to grow throughout childhood. This cartilage will expand and be replaced by bone tissue from the more proximal end. So as this cartilage tissue grows and pushes the epiphysis more distal, it is replaced by bone tissue proximally by the process of endochondral ossification. The epiphyseal plate should therefore remain roughly the same diameter. However, the long bones will grow significantly longer as opposed to wider. So the growth of bone tissue requires a number of different signaling molecules. For starters, we need growth factors that simply tell the bones where to grow. Next up are a class of signals called homeobox signals that tell which bones to grow where. For instance, in our limbs, we have this pattern of one bone, then two bones, then four bones, similar to the way that a tree grows. Lastly, we might have some polarizing factors that tell the bones whether they are more medial or more proximal. In the limbs, this molecule is called sonic hedgehog, and we'll be talking about it throughout the year. Teratogens are chemicals that can inhibit the development of the body in utero, causing birth defects. One example of a teratogen is a molecule known as cyclopamine. This one inhibits the sonic hedgehog molecule that I just talked about. It is found in the California lily, 
and ranchers on the west coast know to remove this plant from their fields because if a pregnant cow or sheep were to eat it their babies would be cyclopic that's because a chemical in this plant inhibits sonic hedgehog therefore the developing fetus does not know what is the more medial versus the more lateral edges of its body and everything winds up being centered compact bone can only grow via appositional growth meaning adding a layer upon another layer upon another layer there is a maximum diameter for an osteon and that is because all the nutrients come from the center and have to diffuse via the canaliculi to get to the outer edges therefore if we need more bone tissue we have to start another osteon the trabeculae also have layers similar to an osteon but there is no central canal and the layers are not concentric they spiral outwards nevertheless there are still osteocytes living in lacunae connected to each other by canaliculi but they get most of their nutrients from their outer edges and it diffuses inwards so let's summarize our different types of layers osteons have concentric lamellae everything is centered around the central canal I then have circumferential lamellae that bind all of the osteons together lastly you may find some interstitial lamellae these are layers in between the osteons not on the outer edges so the bones will continue to grow from the epiphyseal plates up until puberty and at this time the bone tissue outgrows the cartilage tissue and completely replaces it the epiphyseal plate is now a small line of compact bone known as the epiphyseal line at this stage the long bones could no longer grow longer <laughs> that's a little redundant here's an x-ray of a young person's bones and we can see the epiphyseal plates these apparent gaps on the x-ray are regions where there is cartilage that does not absorb the radiation later in life this cartilage would be replaced with compact bone and you might be able to see these more radio opaque lines that represent the epiphyseal lines the skull and a few other bones develop by what's called intramembranous ossification it's exactly the same as endochondral ossification just replace the word cartilage with connective tissue and there you have it I have replaced connective tissue with bone tissue one of the major differences is that rather than leaving little areas of cartilage like at the epiphyseal plates or the articular surfaces I instead leave little regions of connective tissue these would be called the soft spots uh, of the skull of a newborn so that sums up hollow bones and compact bone tissue we talked about the difference between the periosteum and the endosteum and I talked about the steps of endochondral ossification those are going to continue to be important dermal ossification or intramembranous ossification is pretty much the same thing only with a different type of model to begin with and now would be a very good time to take a break grab a drink and come back in a little bit the growth of bone tissue is primarily regulated by a hormone called growth hormone this is secreted from the anterior pituitary other hormones can also induce bone growth including thyroid hormone and estrogen and testosterone the latter two not only promote bone growth but they can change the way that bones grow for instance these are responsible for the differences in the shape of the hips and the facial bones 
defects in growth hormone can lead to gigantism and or dwarfism. The overproduction of growth hormone prior to puberty leads to a condition called gigantism. This will cause the epiphyseal plates to grow too much, leading to the increase in size of the long bones. Growth hormone also increases the growth of most other organs in the body. When this hormone is overproduced after puberty, because there are no epiphyseal plates to grow from, the long bones can only increase in size from appositional growth, meaning adding layers to the outer edges. This leads to a condition called acromegaly, where bones grow too thick. This is most noticeable in very fine bone structures, such as the hands and certain facial features. So here are a couple of pictures. On the left, of course, is Andre the Giant, who had gigantism. Because his condition was not treated, it later developed into acromegaly. He continued to overproduce growth hormone after puberty. As you can see, it is not his fault that he was bigger and stronger than the average person. He didn't even have to exercise. On the right, we see a person who suffers from acromegaly. They had a pituitary tumor that led to the overproduction of growth hormone after puberty. Because his long bones already had epiphyseal lines, they could not grow longer, but they could grow thicker, which led to a distortion of his finer bone features, as we see here in his hands and facial features. On the other hand, an underproduction of growth hormone can lead to the opposite condition. It can lead to a type of dwarfism. This is called proportional dwarfism because it affects all bones and tissues equally. This is a rare form of dwarfism. Much more common is a condition called achondroplasia. Growth hormone is just fine in this condition, but the growth of cartilage is not. This means that the growth of long bones is diminished. Hence, achondroplasia is not proportionate. It primarily affects the length of long bones. The skull and thoracic cage are of average size, but the arms and legs are below average in length. For those interested in genetics, this is a genetically dominant trait. It requires only one allele to have this condition. Here are two pictures of the two predominant forms of dwarfism. On the left, we see a man who has a growth hormone deficiency. This is considered proportional dwarfism. You will notice that his arms and legs are in proportion to his head and torso. Whereas on the right, we see a family whose three of four members suffer from achondroplasia. Their arms and legs are disproportionately shorter than their head and torso. The gentleman in the background is, of course, their son. This means that both parents are heterozygous. They both carry the wild type allele. Therefore, there's a one in four chance that their children will not suffer from achondroplasia. And I do use that word suffer, not that there's anything wrong with being shorter in stature. However, this condition does lead to a number of health conditions, including a shorter life expectancy. Next up, we need to cover the topic of bone remodeling. As bones go throughout life, they change. This is definitely a living tissue. Bone tissue is removed and then replaced. There is a turnover rate between these two. If deposition is higher than removal, bones will grow stronger. On the other hand, if the removal is faster, then bones will grow weaker, and this can lead to a condition called osteoporosis. This is carried out by what we call the remodeling unit which is 
a mixture of osteoblasts and osteoclasts working together. It's very important that these two cell types work together. It would be very difficult to tell where small fractures appear in a concrete wall. If they appear on the surface, you would be able to fix them, but if they appear anywhere underneath the surface, you would have no idea of their existence until potentially they got so bad that it caused structural damage. For this reason, we continually destroy and replace bone tissue to make sure that any unseen cracks get repaired. And this is done by the remodeling unit. In a healthy individual, the amount of removal done by the osteoclasts should equal the amount of deposition done by the osteoblasts. So just a heads up for the word nerds who are listening, resorb is an actual word. When I eat calcium and it gets absorbed into my bloodstream from my digestive tract, we call that to absorb. Some of that calcium may go into my bone tissue. If I remove that calcium from my bone tissue back into the bloodstream, that's what we call resorption. So bone resorption is a process carried out by osteoclasts. These are cells that are similar to the white blood cell known as a macrophage. It's very important for these cells to remove bone tissue on a regular basis because bone tissue can build up microfractures. Osteocytes can repair a small amount of damage, but if these fractures were significant, they would not be able to replace this tissue. Hence, it's important to simply remove bone tissue every so often by a osteoclast and then replace it by osteoblasts. This should ensure that bone tissue remains healthy and that these microfractures do not build up. Here are a few cartoons of osteoclasts in action. They can secrete hydrochloric acid and some digestive enzymes to digest bone tissue, releasing calcium back into the bloodstream. This brings up a very important concept, and that is that calcium plus phosphate turns into a crystal on its own. This requires no enzymes, although enzymes could speed it up. All of our cells have lots of phosphate floating around our cytoplasm. ATP contains three phosphates, and every time we use one of those molecules for energy, it leaves a phosphate floating around. DNA and RNA are also composed of a sugar phosphate backbone, so there always has to be plenty of phosphate floating around our cells. For this reason, we can't just have calcium floating around our cells. Nevertheless, I can't do without calcium. It's absolutely required for muscle tissue in order to contract and for nervous tissue in order to fire electrical signals. Therefore, I need a certain amount of calcium in most of my tissues at any given time. I can't have too much, which means I can't just store excess amounts of calcium in my cells. And yet I also can't rely on my diet. Calcium is not a very common element in food. Therefore, I need to have some sort of storage mechanism. That's bone tissue. At some point, the human body figured out that it could store calcium in cartilage tissue, which ossified that tissue and turned it into bone tissue. So this is where we store all of our excess calcium is in bones. That has the added benefit of making bones very strong, and so I can use them to move around and for support. But the primary reason for having bone tissue in the first place is simply as a place to store calcium. This slide illustrates what happens when you cannot regulate your intracellular calcium levels 
this woman suffered from and died from a condition called fibrodysplasia ossificans, wherein too much calcium entered into our muscle cells, reacted with phosphate, and essentially turned into bone tissue. You can see on the right her skeleton at her time of death, and many of her muscles now look like bones. Technically, they're not bones because they don't have osteocytes in them. It's just calcium phosphate crystals. Wherever stress is placed on a bone, it leads to bone growth. This leads to the formation of spines, tubercles, and other bumps on the skeletal system that anatomists have given names, and you are required to learn and regurgitate on exams. So where a muscle attaches to a bone, the bone was just flat. But when the muscle puts tension on that spot, that area begins to grow thicker and eventually becomes a bump that somebody ultimately gave a name and you learned. Here are a couple of examples of ways that you can put pressure on bones without using muscles. A number of Native American tribes have a history of placing the skull bones under pressure using boards and ropes, and this leads to growth of the skull bones. An alternative hypothesis is that these represent alien human hybrids. You know, you can figure out which one you want to believe. The way that this happens is that when pressure is placed on bone tissue, it pushes these ions closer together, and this leads to electrical gradients. These electrical gradients are detected by osteoblasts, and in response to this, osteoblasts will lay down new bone tissue. Next up, proper bone growth requires an adequate amount of calcium and phosphate. This in turn requires an adequate amount of the hormone calcitriol, which we learned in the previous chapter requires adequate exposure to UV light in the skin. Bone growth requires a number of other cofactors. There's a large list of different vitamins and other molecules that are needed for bone growth. This is not a list that I expect you to memorize. We will cover a few of these in detail and skip over the rest. It's absolutely necessary to get an adequate amount of vitamin D and calcium in the diet to have healthy bones. However, the usage of vitamin D and calcium supplements has been coming under some scrutiny as of late. A very large study looking at vitamin D supplements found that only a small percentage of women who took these supplements were able to get a benefit, and that benefit was very modest. On the other hand, calcium supplements so far have shown no benefit when it comes to bone health. In fact, the U.S. Pre Preventative Services Task Force no longer recommends calcium and vitamin D supplements for any patients. There's a large list of hormones that we need to cover. Please keep in mind my background in endocrinology and you should realize that you really do need to learn a little bit about all of these different molecules. I can make it a little bit simpler from the start. Only parathyroid hormone leads to a decrease in bone density. It does so by activating osteoclasts. All of the others lead to an increase in bone density. And your next job is to determine whether that effect is direct or indirect. Let's start with calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. These two hormones regulate blood calcium levels. They can both affect bone tissue, but their primary job is to ensure that blood calcium levels remain at a constant level, not too low and not too high. When blood calcium levels drop, this would prevent muscle cells from contracting. It would prevent my nervous tissue from firing electrical signals, and it would prevent my blood from clotting. 
altogether, this means it would prevent me from living. I need to have an adequate amount of calcium in the bloodstream at all times. So when blood calcium drops too low, the parathyroid glands secrete parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone does a number of things. For instance, activating osteoclasts, which can release calcium back into the bloodstream, bringing it back to its homeostatic set point. On the other end, I don't want too much calcium. If I had too much calcium in the bloodstream, it might begin to diffuse into my cells. And if it did that, it could react with phosphate. And if it did that, it would start to crystallize, which would damage and kill my cells. Therefore, I need to have calcium levels high enough, but not too high. So whenever calcium levels go too high, I release calcitonin into the bloodstream, and this will lower blood calcium levels. For instance, by moving that calcium back into my bone tissue. So, my blood calcium levels are tightly regulated by two negative feedback loops. Parathyroid hormone makes sure that my blood calcium levels are always adequate. Calcitonin ensures that my blood calcium levels are never too high. These are considered mirror hormones, which means they work against one another. I should only have one in the bloodstream at any given time. It would be impossible for me to have both too much and too little calcium in the blood at any given time. So, if my calcium levels are not at the adequate level, I will either have PTH or calcitonin in the bloodstream. PTH, once again, is released when blood calcium levels drop. Calcitonin, on the other hand, is released when blood calcium levels go too high. Both of these hormones work at the three same target locations. This means you only have to memorize how one of them works, and then just remember that the other one is the exact opposite. Let's start with parathyroid hormone. No, let's start with calcitonin. Calcitonin is secreted when blood calcium levels are too high, and its job is to remove that calcium one way or another. It can do so by inhibiting calcium absorption from the gut. It can increase calcium excretion from the kidneys, and it can also activate osteoblasts. These cells will take the calcium from the bloodstream and turn it into the extracellular matrix of bone tissue, and this can lead to an increase in bone density. Parathyroid hormone does the opposite. It will increase calcium absorption from the gut, it will decrease calcium excretion from the kidneys, and it activates osteoclasts, which tend to degrade bone tissue, releasing calcium back into the bloodstream. So these two hormones have the exact opposite effects of one another. Luckily for you, they affect the same three tissues, which cuts the amount of memorization that you need to do in half. PTH can increase calcium absorption from the gut by activating calcitriol. Here's where things are starting to get a little bit more complicated. Calcitriol, as you remember, was the hormone that was produced from skin, converted from cholesterol using the energy from UV light and eventually traveling to the kidneys to turn into a hormone that increased calcium absorption from the gut. So the effects of PTH on the gut are indirect. It will increase calcitriol activity. Calcitriol does not care what blood calcium levels are. It simply increases calcium absorption from the gut. If you already had enough calcium in your bloodstream, calcitriol would lead to an increase in blood calcium levels. So, this may seem a little bit complicated. 
You might think of calcitriol as being good for the bones, but PTH tends to be bad for the bones, and yet it activates calcitriol. We have to take a step back and remember that, one, calcitriol doesn't care about the bones at all. It just increases calcium absorption from the gut. And two, PTH doesn't care about the bones at all either. It just cares about blood calcium levels, and it will try to increase blood calcium any way that it can, including degrading bone tissue by activating osteoclasts, as well as activating calcitriol, which should increase calcium absorption from the gut. So if you're not confused yet, be prepared for endocrinology, which is just confusing. One of the drugs that we can use to treat osteoporosis is a drug that mimics parathyroid hormone. In theory, activating parathyroid hormone should actually decrease bone density. It's rather strange that drugs that mimic this hormone can actually do the exact opposite. All that I will say right now is that the endocrine system is complicated, and we'll get to that later in the term. There are a number of other hormones which affect bone density. The sex steroids are very important. Predominantly, this includes estrogen and testosterone. Both of these can increase bone density. One major difference between men and women is that women will go through menopause and stop producing estrogen around the age of 45 to 50, whereas men will continue to produce testosterone throughout their life. It can decrease with age, but not to the amount that women lose estrogen production. For this reason, women are going to be at a much higher risk for osteoporosis because they lose one of the hormones that increases bone density. Thyroid hormone is also important for bone density. I'll talk more about thyroid hormone in the endocrine system chapter. So here is the summary slide of the hormones that I just covered. There are two mirror hormones, PTH and calcitonin, whose job is regulating blood calcium levels. It's true that they can affect the bones, but they don't really care about the bones. They just care about making sure that blood calcium levels are always adequate, but not too high. When blood calcium drops, that will trigger the release of PTH, and when blood calcium rises, that triggers the release of calcitonin. On the right-hand side, we have a number of hormones that tend to increase bone density, either directly or indirectly. Growth hormone directly increases bone density. This is our primary regulator of bone growth. Estrogen and testosterone, these are the abbreviations for those two molecules, also tend to increase bone density. They're not quite as strong as growth hormone, but they do have beneficial effects on bone density. Calcitriol, on the other hand, is indirect. It doesn't care about your bones. It simply increases calcium absorption from the gut. If you already had a healthy amount of blood calcium, calcitriol would increase that. In turn, that would trigger the release of calcitonin, which would activate osteoblasts, which would deposit some of that calcium into your bone tissue, leading to an increase in bone density. Just keep in mind that you can also find calcitriol in the bloodstream when blood calcium is too low. When that happens, PTH is secreted, which activates calcitriol to try and increase calcium absorption from the gut. To summarize, we cannot look at calcitriol levels and make any sort of diagnosis as to whether bone density is healthy or unhealthy. Lastly, thyroid hormone is a little bit complicated, and I'll cover that in more detail in the last chapter of the term.
So that covers the hormones. Make sure you understand when these hormones are produced and what their effects are on the body, especially related to bone tissue, whether that's a direct effect or an indirect effect. Now that we've learned about bone tissue, we can move on to discuss osteoporosis. This is a condition that affects bone density. In healthy bone tissue, the remodeling units should be balanced. The amount of bone resorption done by osteoclasts should be equal to the deposition done by the osteoblasts, and this will keep bone tissue healthy. In osteoporosis, there is an imbalance. The amount of bone loss exceeds bone deposition. This will affect spongy bone more than compact bone. Spongy bone has a lot more surface area that means the remodeling units are already working harder on this tissue. So if bone deposition slows down for any reason, it'll be the spongy bone tissue that's affected first. Two of our treatments for osteoporosis include vitamin D and calcium supplements. As we discussed earlier, the benefits of these two are at best modest. A better treatment is exercise. As we discussed earlier, putting any amount of stress on bones tends to increase osteoblast activity, and that can help to slow down the effects of osteoporosis. The biggest effects that we can see with exercise actually occur in childhood and as young adults in preventing osteoporosis. Once the disease has already set in, it's very difficult to reverse and getting patients to exercise when they have brittle bones can be a challenge. So you might prescribe low intensity workouts such as aqua aerobics. When those measures don't work, there are also a number of drugs that can be given. I will not be testing you on the names of these drugs, but looking at some of their names, a few things should pop out as familiar. For instance, in bisphosphonates, you should be looking at phosphate. Remember the inorganic portion of the extracellular matrix in bone tissue is calcium plus phosphate crystals. Sex hormone therapy used to be a lot more common. Keep in mind that both estrogen and testosterone tend to increase bone density, but women lose estrogen production around the age of 50 or so. And this last class of drugs are totally weird, the PTH analogs. What we've learned is that parathyroid hormone decreases bone density because it activates osteoclasts. Because osteoporosis is difficult to reverse, it's better to try and prevent it. And that might mean trying to catch it early. So low bone density that's not yet considered a disease is called osteopenia. This is normal for people as we get older. Just for women, it tends to accelerate around the time of menopause. Again, osteoporosis and osteopenia affect bones that have a lot of spongy bone in them. That includes the jaws, which can lead to loss of teeth, and also the femur. A hip fracture is actually a fracture around the surgical neck of the femur, where there is a lot of spongy bone. The vertebrae are also affected, and because these are under a lot of stress, it can actually cause them to become compacted, and the patient will lose height. So osteoporosis affects a large number of people as we get older. There can be some rather exceptional causes, such as a tumor that secretes a hormone that activates osteoclasts. But usually this is just a part of getting older that we can try to prevent. Some of the late symptoms of osteoporosis can include pain, fractures that are abnormal, a hip fracture is a very rare fracture for somebody to suffer in the absence of any sort of major trauma like a car accident or skiing accident. People can lose height because the vertebrae become compressed 
and changes to the vertebrae can also lead to a hunched back or kyphosis. And again, these symptoms all come from the fact that it's bones that have a lot of spongy bone are the ones that are affected the most. To try and diagnose this disease before it happens, we can now do a DEXA scan, which is a low dose of x-ray. We do a lower dose so that the film is not just blasted out in sharp black and white, but instead we get levels of gray that a computer can analyze and convert into a number that represents bone density. So, we talked about stress on bone tissue and how that can lead to remodeling. We talked about the remodeling units and why it's important for both osteoclasts and osteoblasts to work together. We covered a number of hormones and then brought that all together to discuss the disease osteoporosis. The last thing that we need to cover are bone fractures. These are usually caused by physical stress, but this can be exacerbated by certain diseases like osteoporosis. There are a number of steps to fracture repair. Luckily for you, they're very similar to two things that we've already discussed. Repairing bone tissue is very similar to repairing skin with a few added steps, but those added steps will simply recapitulate endochondral ossification. So when a bone is fractured, the first thing it's going to do, just like the skin, is form a blood clot. This internal blood clot would be called a hematoma. A bunch of fibroblasts will come down and start laying down scar tissue. Those collagen fibers provide a scaffold for which more mesenchymal stem cells are going to be able to migrate into the area. We also trigger angiogenesis, so more blood vessels grow into this area. Next up, some of those mesenchymal stem cells will differentiate into chondroblasts, and they will convert the scar tissue into fibrocartilage. And this will produce what is called a soft callus. We need to do this first because I can't just lay down bone tissue wherever I want. I have to have a scaffold first in the form of cartilage. Now that I have that fibrocartilage scaffold, more mesenchymal stem cells can migrate into the area, differentiate into osteoblasts, and replace that with bone tissue. We would call this the hard callus. The last thing that will happen is the same thing that happens in skin. I'm going to replace some of that stuff that I just dumped there with the type of tissue I actually want. I'll make sure I have compact bone on the outer edges, spongy bone in the middle, possibly even a hollow medullary cavity. So this last step was the remodeling step. I also got rid of those extra blood vessels that I now no longer need. So I have typed out all of the things that I just said on the previous slide for you here. These are our four major steps in bone fracture repair. But you should see the similarities between wound healing in the skin and endochondral ossification. For a really complicated fracture, one where a bunch of bone tissue is missing, it can be very difficult for the mesenchymal stem cells to make the scaffolds that are needed to ultimately be replaced with bone tissue. So if a bunch of bone tissue is missing, surgeons might do a bone graft, take some bone from elsewhere in the body. A bone that you don't need, like the fibula, could be removed and placed where you do need that tissue to help fix the break. This is a fairly invasive and complicated surgery, and we don't need actual bone tissue to get the healing process going. We just needed the scaffold, like that soft callus. Once we have a scaffold, mesenchymal stem cells can migrate into the area and do all of the healing that is needed. But researchers are working to develop artificial scaffolds 
that can be molded into the place that we need them. These scaffolds are really nothing but collagen or other polymers that mimic collagen. This gives the framework that mesenchymal stem cells need to migrate into the area. They figure out where they're located, start laying down cartilage and ultimately bone tissue in a way that would not have happened without intervention. It turns out those mesenchymal stem cells know that they should be making cartilage and then bone based off of their external environment. They get information from the collagen and the fibronectin that exists in that soft callus. Remember, mesenchymal stem cells could also make scar tissue and skin tissue. So why don't we do that here? Well, they get information from their scaffold, but they also get hormones. And there's a link to a video down there for the way that scientists have been tricking these mesenchymal stem cells into turning into osteoblasts. And they actually give the DNA for the hormone to these cells, and the cells make the hormone themselves. Based off of that hormone and the density of the scaffold that they are in, that gives them the instructions to turn into osteoblasts and start repairing this really complex fracture that would have not been able to repair itself. So there's a number of different types of fractures. If you're going into radiology, you should probably cover these now. But for the rest of us, I will not be putting these names on an exam. Those scaffolds plus hormones are a thing of the near future. For now, it's surgery. Really complex fractures may require plates and screws to help hold bones into place while they heal. This significantly increases the time that it takes for these bones to go through the healing process. One problem with healing bones is that we can't put any stress on them. And without stress, the osteoblasts aren't working as hard as they would otherwise. So an electrical bone stimulator tries to mimic stress, or more accurately, it mimics the electric field that stress on bone tissue would produce to try and activate those osteoblasts and get them working as hard as possible. How well these devices work is up to a little bit of debate. So we just finished fracture repair and we referred to previous material. We referred to endochondral ossification and even wound healing in the skin. And then we talked about complicated fractures, and we had to remember that stress could generate electric fields in bone tissue as those ions are squished closer to one another. And that should wrap us up for the chapter on bones.